Welcome everyone uh, to the Wayward Festival and uh, virtually to Aberdeen. Um, the festival is brought to you by the Word Centre for Creative Writing with the generous support of Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen. And we're delighted um, to be able to have Leila Abuleli with us today. I'm um, uh, Professor Nadia Kiwan, uh, Professor in French and Francophone Studies at the University of Aberdeen. We're also delighted to have Leslie Querra to provide BSL interpretation for us here today. And so she should be visible throughout the event. Um, we also have live captions um, brought to you by Norma McKay. Um, so if you want to enable closed captions um, so you can see them at the bottom of your screen, just click on the CC button uh, um, on your Zoom. So um, today we're going to be talking about decolonizing the imagination and freeing reading and writing from the legacy of empire. Um, and Leila will uh, start with a short presentation, um, at which point I'll, I'll ask her um, a question about her current work, and then she'll go back into the main uh, masterclass aspect of her presentation, where she'll present the four texts, African texts, which she's taking as her inspiration to think about decolonizing the imagination. Um, at that point, um, we will open it to audience uh, question and answer Q&A. So if you have questions, please pop them into the Q&A box and we'll keep an eye on that. You can, you can start putting your questions in at any time uh, and we'll certainly spend about 15 minutes uh, towards the end of the hour to, um, to work through those. Okay. So, yeah, um, I'm delighted then to be chairing this session with Leila Abu Leila. Um, just a little bit about uh, uh, Leila, who's an Aberdeen-based author. Many of you will know uh, already. Um, she was born in Cairo. She grew up in uh, Khartoum in Sudan, uh, where she graduated in a degree in economics from the University of Khartoum. Um, she then came to Britain, where she uh, gained um, an MPhil in statistics from the London School of uh, Economics. And in 1990, Leila moved to Scotland um, and she started writing fiction in 1992 while working as a lecturer uh, in Aberdeen College and later as a research assistant at Aberdeen University. From 2000, Leila and her family moved around Jakarta, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Doha before moving back to Aberdeen in 2012. So uh, Leila's work as a, as a writer has received much critical acclaim. Um, uh, she's written short fiction, plays, um, five novels, including The Kindness of Enemies, Minaret, and most recently Bird Summons. Her debut novel, The Translator, was one of the New York Times' um, 100 Notable Books of the Year, whilst Lyrics Alley was fiction winner of the Scottish Book uh, Awards. Leila was also the first winner of the Kane Prize for African Writing, and her latest uh, short story collection, Elsewhere Home, won the Saltire Fiction Award uh, for Book of the Year. And she's currently writing a historical novel set in Sudan. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Leila. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nadia, for this uh, warm welcome. And um, hello, everyone. It's very exciting to see that you're all coming from different uh, parts of the world. And, and it's, uh, it's nice that we're all here together. And hopefully one day we can all welcome you to, to Aberdeen. So I'll start with sharing my screen. And okay. Here we are. So as uh, Nadia told you, I, I come from uh, Sudan and I grew up in, in Khartoum, which you can see on the map. And um, Omdurman, which is very near uh, Khartoum, it's just like across the, the bridge, is where my father uh, was born and uh, where my father grew up. And um, um, uh, Omdurman is very much, uh, so the Sudanese are very proud of Omdurman. It's like our, um, it represents our heritage. It, it's, uh, we like the word authentic very much, and we, the Sudanese would describe Omdurman as an authentic place. So where, whereas Khartoum is, um, is kind of cosmopolitan, it's where all the embassies are, it's where, you know, that's where the international schools I, I went to are, 
um, Umm Durman was very much um, uh, traditional, very uh, Islamic, very, um, you know, steeped in history. It's where the national theater is. It's, it's a cultural, it's a cultural uh, place. And um, uh, so, and it's also where my, my, my dad actually is, is, is buried now in the family, um, you know, burial uh, place. So I do have a very kind of personal connection to, to Umm Durman. This is Umm Durman, not, not, not cartoon. So I then was in to find that there is a, a road called Umm Durman Road in Southampton, England. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the Sudanese, if, if, you're, if you're Sudanese in, um, in Southampton, you might be like, oh, happy to see the, 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 the road is, is called the Omdurman uh, Road. And if you are like me, you would then, you know, have all these, um, you know, images of Omdurman, like this is the souk, this is the souk in Omdurman. Um, this is a, a, um, a husband and wife in Omdurman. You can see the Nile in the background. I love this photo. I found it on Facebook and I just feel very attached to it because, it, it, you know, this, this lady reminds me of my aunties and I, we used to visit them in Omdurman a lot. Um, as a writer, the, 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 this photo kind of like sparks my imagination. I, I know that, uh, I, uh, that the tea she's drinking has powdered milk in it because, oops, I went to back, yeah. The tea that she's drinking has powdered milk in it because the Sudanese like using powdered milk, um, and that this the 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 you know the stick that she's got the walking stick. I'm imagining that it came to her from abroad, and that she's maybe got a son who's you know working abroad and and, and so on. But uh, and the, the slide gave me away the um, oops yes. So the the Omdurman the road that's named Omdurman is not really uh, about the Omdurman that, that I think of in my head. It is about the Battle of Omdurman, which took place in September 19, 1898. And this was the battle in which uh, Britain uh, conquered uh, Sudan, invaded uh, Sudan. So this is a nice photo also uh, from a creative writing point of view of, the, of these soldiers leaving London uh, for the Sudan and in order to fight in the Battle of, uh, of, of Omdurman. You can see that they're all very young and, and, and excited and, and you know, very um, uh, going off in a kind of adventure. This is a, this is a picture of the Battle of, of Omdurman. Um, and it says that the, the you know that this was a, a victory, and uh, of course a lot of these pictures would always have the the victors you know always elevated the, the, you know you see them always up and you see the 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 the, the Sudanese would be in a lower part of of the of the of the of the illustration or or, or the painting, um, and then okay so. Um, this is a fun fact that the that Winston Churchill was uh, fighting in in the Battle of uh, of Omdurman, and uh, he um, he said that um, he described it in a letter to his um, uncle, the, to his cousin, the Duke of Marlborough. He wrote and he said, uh, "The battle was a wonderful spectacle. I had the good luck to ride through the charge unhurt, indeed untouched." The whole thing was a matter of seconds, for as you may have gathered, we burst through their line and formed up the other side. So he also went on to say um, that it was, uh, there were severe losses on the British side. But then if you look at the figures, these are the casualties of the Battle of Omdurman, you find that, um, you know, the, this discrepancy that, you know, 47 men were killed from the British side, whereas 11,000 men were killed from the Sudanese side. And again, with the wounded, there's this huge, huge uh, uh, differences. And there was, a, there was an American uh, journalist who was uh, part of the, um, uh, you know, expedition, the, 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 the army. And he said, uh, it was not a battle, but an execution. The bodies were not in heaps, bodies hardly ever are, but they spread evenly across acres and acres. Some lay very composedly with their slippers placed under their heads for a last pillow. Some knelt cut short in the middle of a last prayer. Others were torn uh, to pieces. And the reason for this discrepancy in the numbers was because of the, 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 the firepower 
as they say. I'm not a you know an expert on, on military matters and things, but but the, the British army at the time, of course, was vastly, vastly, vastly better equipped than the Sudanese who who fought. Uh, mostly with 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 swords and very you know limited uh, gun gun gunfire, and also I think they were trying. The British also were had new kind of like um, state of the art cannons and guns and and and, and so the very very kind of uh, powerful uh, stuff that they were equipment that they were um, using. So. Um, this is um, this is a Sudanese man who was on the Sunnis who, who witnessed the Battle of Omdurman. His name is Babikar uh, Badri, and he fought in the Battle of Omdurman as a very young man as well. This photo was taken uh, when he was a lot uh, older. He had a, a long uh, life, and um, he was actually um, quite amazing in that he became. Um, the founder of, of uh, women's education in, in, in Sudan. He set up schools for girls and uh, the college that he, the, one of the schools that he set up is still now a women's college in Omdurman itself. So he describes his time, he describes the battle and he says, um, the enemy army, so he's talking about the British army, the enemy army did not pause in its advance upon us soldiers of the blue flag. Uh, until it was quite near and their bullets started to reach us or went pouring and whizzing over our heads. I rubbed my face into the sand, trying to bury my head in it, faultless of suffocation. So distracted was I by the fear of death. So this is him in his memoirs talking about the, the battle which he um, survived um, and went on to live a, a long life. This, another, this is one of the soldiers that the British fought against. So there they are, as you saw the photo of uh, Winston Churchill and the, the, the pictures. These were the kind of people they were, they were fighting, uh, very simple, uh, you know, with their swords. Um, you can see here the, um, the kind of um, clothes they're wearing. It's called a jibba and it was patched. And actually quite recently, um, one of the families, one of the descendants of the British soldiers handed back one of these um, um, jibbas, as they call one of the, uh, to, to, the, to the Sudanese embassy in, in, in London. Um, you know, it, it, they had kept it in their attic for, uh, for, for, for uh, you know, for over the, the, the generations. Um, we can imagine how it was, um, you know, uh, procured. Uh, this is a, a real, this is an illustration of a real uh, Sudanese uh, woman, a real character, historical character. Her name is Rabeha from the Kanana tribe. And she played a role um, before the British conquest, 20, um, say maybe 20 years before the British conquest. She uh, played, uh, played a role in, in rebelling against uh, foreign, uh, foreign in invasion. So she's quite a, a hero in, um, you know, in, in Sudan's um, history. So the 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 battle of uh, the battle of Omdurman actually, if you're a student in Sudan, if you're Sudanese, you would never really hear about the battle of Omdurman because it has another name. It's called uh, Karari. It's called the 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 um, the, um, the battle of 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 Karari. And Karari was the plain outside um, uh, Omdurman where the actual fighting took place. So the, 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 the British didn't invade Omdurman, you know, they didn't go into the town. The town was, relative, was, was safe, people were in their houses um, and the battle and the, the Sudanese army went outside uh, the, 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 the town to, um, to, 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 to meet the, the, the British army as it came in. And the battle took place in this place called Karari. So in, in Sudan's history, we use the word uh, Karari. We, we wouldn't say the battle of Omdurman. We, we would say, because Omdurman of course is so dear to us. And uh, so we always, we would say the battle of, of, of Karari. So um, I'm bringing you back to the, Omdurman Road in Southampton, um, and think and 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 sort of suggesting that it's we, we look at it differently. We would look at it differently now, knowing uh, that the history that is um, that is in, in involved. Um, okay, so yes, um, to 
just to just to to to, to add that that the, the, there were of course valid reasons that for the British conquest that there isn't time for me to go to go over, but it's it's not a it's not a it's not a clear cut situation. Uh, for example, my um, it would be my gra great grandfather, not my grandfather, but my great grandfather in Omdurman, my great grandmother, you know, uh, my aunties at the time, they actually would supported the British the conquest of Sudan. So even though they were living in Omdurman at the time, uh, they they supported the, the British con conquest because of, of of certain reasons that they had, and because they were against the 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 the, the, rule, the rulers at the time, the Sudanese rulers. But I'm sure that they were also, uh, of course, appalled by the number of, 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 of people killed and the number of people uh, wounded. That would have been quite a shock uh, for, for them. Yeah. Thank, thank you uh, so much for that introduction, uh, Leila. Um, as somebody who used to live in Southampton and actually in that area of Southampton, I was not aware of this history at all. So oh, this is really, yeah. really fascinating. And before you go on to uh, talk about the four African texts, which, um, you know, are um, enriching our understanding of decolonizing the imagination. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about your current project. Is that related to this history, to this battle? Um, because as I understand it, your current project is a historical novel. Yeah, I'm I'm working on a historical novel, and it's set uh, it's, it's set over the twenty years leading up to the conquest. So that the so the conquest then comes at the very last a chapter, but the novel then goes on into the reasons for it. So then we you know by the time we get hopefully the reader gets to the end of the book, they would have then understood all the different you know nuances and all the different uh, things that led up to the in the that led up to the invasion of uh, of. Of, uh, of of Sudan, yeah, and I'm hoping to 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 write further. You know, like this could be a trilogy, and then I write, I go on, and I keep going because my interest is very much the link between Scotland and Sudan, and how uh, so many of these officers and so many of uh, the colonial administration in in Sudan were were Scottish, and I like to to kind of make the the, the bridge between the two countries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look forward to it, uh, to reading it when it's finished. Um, I, I'll let you continue now with your, your, the main part of your presentation. Okay, okay, okay. thank you, thank you, Nadia, yeah. So um, I'm going to start now talking about the books, and um, um, there, there's four books here, and uh, they are uh, presented in the order in which they were published through time, with starting with the 50s and then um, uh, the um, Jennifer's uh, uh, Makumbu's book is was published like two years ago. And the books are also nonfiction fiction, nonfiction fiction, and uh, they, they, they pair well uh, together. So starting with uh, Franz uh, Fanon, uh, Black Skin, uh, White Mask, uh, uh, Fanon was born in 1925 in the French colony of uh, Martinique, and um, and then as a young man he went to France and he joined the resistance against uh, the occupying Nazi uh, forces. And while serving in the military, uh, Fanon uh, experienced racism and he became politicized, and uh, he started to identify with um, with the African freedom fighters who came to France. Um, you know, seeking allies against European uh, colonialism. And uh, he began to define a new black uh, identity and to become actively involved in the anti-colonial uh, struggle. So he trained as a, as a psychiatrist and he worked in Algeria uh, where, where he, he did a lot of work with, uh, with the Algerian uh, people. And he um, he studied his patients, and then he um, he he he, uh, he, uh, he put all his work in two books: Black Skin, White Mask, and the other one, which is called The Wretched of the of of the Earth. And um, so. So Fanon uses psychoanalysis to study the effects of racism on individuals. Uh, particularly its impact on the self-perception of Blacks themselves. And uh, Fanon's uh, kind of theory is that he believes that white civilization and European culture 
have imposed an ex existential deviation on, on the black man. So he sees this, con con this, this colonialism, this conquest, as we saw this very brutal uh, coming in of a, of a, of a foreign, uh, foreign army. He sees this as, as, as kind of, um, he's, studying, he's studying its effect on, um, on, on the people themselves. And he believes that this has caused uh, a, psychic, uh, a psychic wound. Um, and um, so that this book is kind of like the first book to investigate the psychology and uh, of colonialism and it explain, ex examines how colonialism is internalized by the colon colonized and how an inferiority complex becomes fixed in, in, in people's uh, minds. So, um, of course, there's very different kinds of, 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 of colonialism that, you know, that is interesting in, in, in itself, uh, the, the kind of the different, uh, to the, you know, the, to how much the, the colonial power imposes itself on, on the colonial uh, subjects. And we will kind of be like exploring that as we go along with, 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 with the books. But the style of, of this, um, of this uh, book is very much um, uh, almost like a rant. He's, he's, he's outraged, Fanon is outraged about what, he, what he's finding. And he's, and he, um, he's appalled. And, and, and as he's appalled, he shocks, he shocks the reader uh, too. So this is, for example, um, what, what the kind of thing that he says. He says, all colonized people position themselves in relation to the civilizing language, i.e. the metropolitan culture. The more the colonized has assimilated the cultural values of the metropol metropolis, the more he will have escaped the bush, the more he rejects his blackness and the bush, the whiter he will become. So, um, so this describes really a kind of a self-hatred, a kind of a, a shame, that people then are, um, uh, you know, made ashamed of their own culture, and that they want to escape the bush. Here, he, he's using the word bush, but it could it, it could then be an escape from, um, you know, the cultural values of our ancestors, the the the, the language, the religion, and and and, and all of all of these uh, things. Um, and then he says what what is very sh quite shocking and upsetting. And he says that, that, that his diagnosis is that the black man wants to be white. Why? Because he's been told uh, by the, the, the colonial system, whiten or perish. So that you, you, this is what the, the message that the, 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 the black man is, is, is getting. And I remember reading uh, this, this particular book in university in, in Khartoum, and I was 18 years old, and I was, you know, horrified by this. I couldn't believe that anyone could actually say this. It, it seemed to me like, like, like uh, Fanon was saying something that no one would ever dare say, that no one in polite, this is sort of stuff that no one in polite society would, would actually come up and say. And uh, it horrified me, especially because, um, you know, I came from a, a family that was very much uh, pro-Western, um, that, it, it, of course, they didn't speak in terms of, of white, whiteness, but they spoke in terms of modernity, they spoke in terms of education, they spoke in terms of, you know, progress. These were the words that were used that we, you know, we mustn't be backward, we mustn't be fall behind, we mustn't, we must improve. So this was very much that the, 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 the climate I was, was growing up in. And I wouldn't say that the book changed me, but it did make me aware. It, 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 it instilled it in me a, a huge self-awareness so that every decision I took and every, every kind of opinion that was forming in me, I would be asking myself, I would be checking, you know, um, what, what is going on here with me? You know, why am I saying this? Why am I uh, evaluating things in, 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 in that way? Um, so he, and then this is something, this is another quote from the book. He says, some blacks want to prove at all costs to the whites, the wealth of the black man's intellect and equal intelligence. And he says that this is what racism does then and to, 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 to black people, or this is what colonialism does to black people, is that it puts on this stress. And you can see then uh, he's talking about this, 
this enormous stress of having to prove yourself time and again, that you're always having to work harder, you're always having to make more of an effort, you're always having to, to do a little bit more because you, you carry this, um, uh, this, this, you know, this accusation, you've been accused uh, that you are somehow, you are less. And so you want to be sort of uh, equal. And we can see that even now it's quite common for immigrants to, you know, to tell their children who are growing up in the West, you have to work harder, you, you have to work harder. And that's like a matter of fact, you know, the, the, the way they speak to their ch children in, 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 in that way. Uh, another quote is that uh, is of him wanting, this is what he wants by his work, that he wants to liberate the black man from the arsenal of complexes that germinated in a colonial situation and he wants to enable healthy relations between blacks and and whites so he he wants this kind of this positivity okay um so okay so let's move on to the next uh, book then and that is uh, Taib Saleh's uh, Season of Migration to the North. This is a novel and um, a, a Sudanese uh, writer. Taib Saleh was born in, in Northern Sudan, same time as, as, as Fanon, not much different, a couple of years uh, later than Fan Fanon, 29. And he grew up um, in a village on the banks of the Nile. It sounds very romantic and nice. And it is described very nicely in his, in his book. And he was educated in Quranic schools, and then he went to, uh, he was, he also um, studied in, in Sudan in Khartoum, and then he went to London to study at the University of London, and he worked for the BBC uh, Arabic uh, service. And um, Tayyip Saleh, I, I met him uh, a few times, he's very, he was very sophisticated, very sophisticated person, and uh, very, very nice. And uh, th th this book is just incredible. Every everybody I recommend it to, uh, uh, you know, is, loves it. And, uh, oh, my font is too big. I hope you can see that. So um, it tells the story, uh, it, it, it almost like tells a story within a story. So we have a narrator who's unnamed, but a, a, let's say a re reliable narrator. And he's returning, uh, he returns from uh, England after studying, and he finds that there's a mysterious character in the village, like a newcomer. And then this, this mysterious um, villager is called Mustafa Saeed, and he starts to tell uh, his story to the, to the young man. And that as a precocious uh, youngster, he had been taken to England, patronized and celebrated by his British colonizers, sought after by women who wanted him to enact their Orientalist sexual fantasies. And in revenge, he leaves behind a trail of suicides and uh, murder. This is this. I just read the, the novel uh, recently, and it's it it felt to me a lot more gentle than than this kind of uh, this description in a way. Um, the, the the women are saying to him. So this is actually the, the, the this is very early in uh, in the twenties London. And so this young man, when he appears in this, he's a, he's a young, handsome black man, and he appears in, in London, um, he exp he's, he's uh, celebrated, you know, he's moving in the right circles, he's uh, brilliant, he goes to Oxford University, so everybody loves him. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a tale of, of, um, of racism and hardship, as we would ex expect. No, it's actually a tale of, a, of, of um, it's, it's a different take on, on, on that. It's, uh, he's, because the, 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 the Sudanese man is, is so brilliant and because he's, a, he's um, you know, an Oxford graduate, he's treated very nice and he moves in very sort of high uh, circles. And these uh, women say to him things like, oh, I smell the jungle on you and things like that. So it's, I smiled a lot when I, when I read that. It, it, it seemed, you know, uh, kind of uh, funny a little bit when I, when I read it recently. And then um, his revenge is not really a kind of a, a determined revenge. He kind of like seems to be sleepwalking into this situation. He can't help it. He's just going through these relationships and then these girls, one of them commits suicide, one of them leaves her husband for him. And, and, but it's not, um, you have to read it to see, to see what I mean. Okay, so, um, so this, so this, um, the Mustafa Saeed, who's 
the, the mysterious uh, um, protagonist, he, um, according to, to Tayyip Saleh in an interview, he says Mustafa Said wants to inflict on Europe the degradation which it has imposed on his people. So he's an, an, a kind of an avenger. He represents a kind of an, uh, um, you know, a, an avenger for the wrongs that were, were, were done. And he says, so this is one of the quotes, Mustafa Said said to them, said to, to, to the British, I have come to you as a conqueror. And then this is another um, quote. I came as an invader into your homes, a drop of the poison which you have injected into the veins of, of, of history, okay? So um, that is kind of the, 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 the quotes from, 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 from the book. And yet, the, yet when you read about Mustafa Said, he's very polite, he's very, um, you know, he's very gentle, he's very sophisticated, he's quoting poetry. And so there's a, there's a, there's a lot of violence in the book, but there's also a lot of uh, this kind of uh, uh, cosmopolitanism, I would say. Um, this is another of uh, the, the, this is a quote from the book, which is very fan on and uh, the, 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 the whole novel bristles with this uh, Fanonian, uh, you know, awareness. So here he's the narr narrator is saying, this is the narrator speaking now, by the standards of the European industrial world, we are poor peasants, but when I embrace my grandfather, I experience a sense of richness as though I am a note in the heartbeats of the very universe. So note the, um, the comparison, the feeling, you know, the kind of self-consciousness. And then this is very much Tayyip Saleh, the, 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 you know, the, the wise, the, 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 the kind of wise um, man who has, uh, to me, I feel this is coming from him having studied the Quran and have, having a kind of broader, uh, you know, uh, vision of the whole thing. And so he says, the fact that they came to our land, they meaning the, the Europeans, does that mean we should poison our present and our future? Sooner or later, they will leave our country, just as many people throughout history left many countries. The railways, ships, hospitals, factories, and schools will be ours, and we will speak their language without either a sense of guilt or a sense of gratitude. So here, actually, he nails it on the head because it's the guilt and the gratitude. That is what uh, we, uh, you know, this is what we want to be liberated from. This is what Fanon wanted us felt that this was the, this was the cure for 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 the for the for the um, you know the what he called the, the 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 psychic wound that we get rid of the guilt and that we get rid of the of of the gratitude because both of them are are not uh, are not healthy for for us. So moving on then uh, to. Um, uh, moving on through time, then we get to Nujuji Wathyongo's decolonizing uh, the mind, and this is um, uh, this could well be the first time that the, the word uh, decolonizing was used, um, uh, not in the technical sense. So the technical sense, or would be that you colonize a country by invading it, by ruling it as a, as a foreign power. And then you decolonize, as in you, um, you, you, you know, you get independence. The way all these African countries got independence, they eventually did in the 50s, and 60s, and 70s. Uh, you know, most of Africa got uh, got its in, independence. But Nduji Watyongu now is talking about something else. It's not just you know telling um, you know uh, getting uh, political independence. It's it's it, uh, decolonizing could involve then the mind as well and the politics of language as he as he, as he's saying. So um, Nduji was young. You was born in Kenya, and uh, and the Kenya of his is of his birth and youth was was a British settler colony. Uh, so this is different than as a, different from Sudan. Sudan never did become a settler a colony. Uh, but 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 Kenya did, and, and as an as an adolescent, um, he Nduji lived through the Mau Mau War of Independence, and uh, and so this this episode this uh, episode and its make and the making of modern Kenya are major themes in his uh, in his uh, work, and so Nduji has always been uh, critical of the inequalities and injustices that uh, Kenyan society faces. 
and and he was arrested by the post-colonial uh, government um, uh, and and uh, and imprisoned without charge because of a of a, of a play that was that, that he that he uh, performed. So um, so he he moved, he kind of builds on Fanon's post-colonial uh, psychoanalysis and he proposes art as a means of healing the trauma of of of, of colonialism. Uh, and this book is a series of, um, uh, of lectures that he gave and, uh, over the years. And, and, um, and, and one of the most important things that comes out of this book is that he presents his decision to stop writing in English and to write in his mother tongue, uh, Chikuyu, starting with his novel, Devil on the Cross, written on toilet paper during his imprisonment without trial in a maximum security prison. So he was in prison and he actually wrote this uh, novel on, on toilet, toilet paper. And he speaks about that in, in, in this book. Um, and um, so Nujuju is very, Nujuju is very concerned with language and he's very um, hurt by how the uh, African languages were suppressed uh, and, uh, and replaced by English, by the language of the colonizer. And he says, uh, and he says that what, this, what, what happens then is that the child's upbringing in the school becomes divorced and disconnected from his spoken language at home. So the child is speaking one language at home, and then at school he's he's speaking and he's being forced to speak in another uh, language. And he says colonialism is a destruction or the deliberate undervaluing of people's culture, their art, dances, religions, history, literature, and the conscious elevation of the language of the colonizer. So this is very much echoes uh, what Canon, what Fanon was 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 saying, that you're undervaluing uh, the, the 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 people, the colonized, and you are elevating the language of the colonizer and the culture of the of, of, of the colonizer as as well. So um, Najuju then championed. Um, um, you know the 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 use of African uh, langu uh, languages and uh, in literature, and although uh, African writers continue to write in European languages, the title of the book and the thrust of it was hugely influential, especially in its discussion of language as a systematic uh, as systematic, and in its championing of African uh, languages. So this is some of the uh, quotations from from the book. He says. Uh, uh, African literature can only be written in African languages. That is the language of the African peasantry and working class. So he then, for him, the, when African literature is written in English or another European language, he calls that Afro-European. He doesn't see that as being really African literature. He says African literature can only be written in an African uh, language. And then he says that I believe that my writing in Jikuyu language and a Kenyan language and African language is part and parcel of the anti-imperialist struggles of Kenyans and African peoples. Okay, and then this is another quote, which is, I feel is, is the one that is kind of is directly to the, to the, the title. And he says, from what base do we look at the world? You know, how are we seeing the world? And he says, reject the primacy of English literature and cultures. African oral tradition is rich and many-sided. So he's, uh, he's telling, uh, you know, the young, the young uh, uh, people and, and, and new writers to look into the African oral tradition and see how uh, rich it is and how there is so much uh, scope in it. Um, also, this is interesting. This made me kind of pause a lot and intrigued me. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I want to share this because I want to think about it also uh, with regard to myself. And and, and I, it's an interesting thing. He says the reception of a given work of art is part of the work itself, or rather, the reception or consumption of the work completes the whole creative process involving that particular artistic object. So that is really something that you know is is uh, could give us lots of food for thought. That uh, that that uh, that every um, given that every work of art, every um, you know um, novel or or any other work of art uh, has has involves in it the reception of it. That is part of the story of this work of of, of art. 
Um, then comes the last uh, last book I'm going to talk about, and this is the first uh, woman by Jennifer um, uh, uh, Makumbi, and. Um, Jennifer was born in Uganda in 1967. She's the youngest of all the writers. And she came to Britain to study and was awarded a PhD from Lancaster University. She lives in Manchester and she's a lecturer of creative writing at Manchester uh, Metropolitan uh, University. Um, the, the novel is set in, um, in, a, in a village in Uganda in the 1970s, and it's about it's set between the village and the capital. And it's about a, vi a village girl uh, moving to the capital, Kampala, in search of her mother. And Makumbi then follows from Nijuju, Nijuji, uh, in that she draws from oral traditions and invites the reader to see the world through the lenses of Ugandan women. And she shares, as she, she says in her own words, uh, Ganda ways of thinking, seeing, of being, and even of, uh, of knowing. And the book is interesting in that it, it, the novel showcases a specifically African feminism distinct from Western uh, feminism. And it's based on the belief of the early ancient people uh, that they had of women being creatures of the sea while men are creatures of the land. And this is why women have been oppressed in most of the world throughout history. Women are either seen as trespassing or as migrants on the land. This is, the, the, this is her telling us the oral tradition with regards to this specifically African kind of, uh, of, of, of feminism. And um, it's, uh, there's, an, one of the, there's an amazing part in the book where there's a description of the, of the inheritance laws uh, in the village regarding women and how women should inherit, you know, very much based on the African tradition, which I found very, very interesting. Um, and also the book also shows um, that um, how um, uh, colonialism and Christianity changed the local customs. And this is not presented as a clash. Instead, the novel points towards ways of moving forward while still staying loyal to, to tradition. So maybe with Tayyip Saleh writing in the 60s and growing up in the 50s, and he, he presented a clash between the, you know, the East and West, uh, Jennifer Makumbu is, 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 is not really presenting it as a, as a, as a, as a clash. Um, this is some of the quotes from the, from, from the book. And the, the language is, 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 is striking. Here she is saying, uh, these news are so burning. It is a surprise. The paper is not on fire. It's, it's, it's lovely to read the, the, the novel because of all this, the, 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 the language of it is, 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 is amazing. And because it is English, but it sounds different. And uh, Makumbi has been credited with imprinting Ganga, Ganda verbal arts on the colonial language. She has produced uh, a hybrid of her mother tongue. This is what critics are saying, that she has produced a hybrid of her mother tongue with English. Sounds, rhythms, texture, and specific words are introduced from the mother tongue into um, English. This is another quote, uh, quotation. Uh, Shirabu had even learned to balance her mind at that precarious edge where she saw time in its natural Ugandan mode, but articulated it in the upside down English mode. At first, it, has felt, it had felt schizophrenic as her mind computed 10 hours of day, but she said four in the afternoon. So this is the, the Shirabu from the village. She's been, you know, showing us the adjustment from... Um, time that even time could have a Ugandan mode you know and it could then have an English mode English mode and she and then the 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 child is then translating between uh the 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 Ugandan time and the 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 English time and being able to know both both uh, time um yeah this is this is a quote about the the um, uh, Christianity uh, and, and its effect on the customs. So one of the things that the book, one of the, the storylines that the book is, 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 is exploring is how in the, in the past, uh, the, the two, two women friends, very close friends, um, wanted, made a pact, two, two schoolgirls made a pact of sharing the same man. 
and then somehow in the future in the in the um, in the 70s that became impossible for the two the the two young girls in 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 the modern Uganda in the post colonial uh, you know modern Uganda influenced by Christianity it became the, the idea became uh, uh, you know not appealing to these young uh, girls so this is what the older woman is saying she's saying in our time two women sharing a man happily was common all my life I never ever saw strife among our mothers and there was five of them often we did not know who was whose mother it did not matter because they loved us equally but with this Christianity all that is gone and then this is another quote where Tom is um, Chirabu's father. He's, 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 young, he's, young, he's a young father and he left the village and he got a corporate job and he's very, um, you know, he's more westernized. Whereas the grandfather uh, is, is the one that who stayed in, in, in the village. And so um, uh, Chirabu is comparing the two and she's saying Tom's European wealth was in, a, was in house gadgets, a car, and in speaking English. And grand, grandfather's wealth was uh, Ganda. So uh, she then, um, in a way, she sees the grandfather as symbolic of tradition, similar to Taib Saleh's reference to his um, grandfather. Uh, um, and um, that's, I think that's, that's me done now. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leila, for that um, uh, very generous presentation. Oh. Um, and I just will remind people we have we have about ten minutes. I think uh, my moderators will tell me if that's wrong. About about ten minutes for audience Q and A. So I'm just a reminder for people if you have questions to pop those into the Q and A. Um, perhaps while people are gathering their thoughts, I can see there's one but I'll, I'll wait until a few kind of queue up. I could just start us off if that's sure. all right with, I mean, I'm just really fascinated um, by how these writers resonate with your own work as an author. And really, I think in all the, in all the texts that you presented the the issue of language is, is, is central, right? It's central to this process of decolonizing the imagination, decolonizing the mind. Um, and I was wondering if you see any parallels say between uh, you know, your work and, and, for example, Jennifer McCombie's use of language. And I'm thinking here of the translator, some people may have read this in the audience, where, where you, you do see, you know, Arabic words in the text, which are not necessarily, they're not explained, there isn't a glossary, and, you know, and uh, I just wondered if that, if you could talk about parallels, but also, you know, differences, perhaps, between your approach to language and some of these, these thinkers and, and writers you've talked about um, today. Yeah, I mean, I, when I use the Arabic words, I'm really thinking very much of, of, of the audience that I didn't want, uh, you know, people who knew Arabic to feel that they were left out. I didn't want them to feel um, that, that uh, oh, that, that they're reading uh, something that's not for them, that is for a Western, uh, Western uh, audience. Uh, so I wanted kind of like to involve them in, in, the, in the reading itself and to, to make them feel that, that, that they were part of it and that they could understand certain words. And I think even for, uh, in the way I don't know French and, and a lot of English literature, when you read it, there'll be French words here and there. And you, you, you kind of pick up the meaning, you get the gist of it as you go along. Uh, and nowadays, of course, with, uh, with Google and all that, it's, um, it's, it's easy to look up a, a certain word if you don't uh, un understand it. So I think that that is really a, a good direction uh, to, go to, to go in, yeah. Yeah, thanks. But it perhaps speaks to this idea of sort of, you know, the, the writer and the reader collaborating a little bit. I think one of the one of the participants put something on, on that front in the yeah. in the chat. OK, I think that the, the questions are piling in into the Q&A, so okay. um, we could get started with those. I can just um, read them. First of all, from um, uh, Nicola. Leila, what do you think about the statue of Gordon on School Hill in Aberdeen? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> You need to come to the symposium on the, which we, we're going to talk about. We're going to mention now at the end of October because I'm going to speak about the statue of Gordon in, in Aberdeen. And Aberdeen is uh, Gordon is one of the characters in my uh, novel that I'm working on. So I, I have a lot to say about about uh, Gordon. So. <laughs> 
yeah, and we'll, we'll put some details about the symposium, uh, which is taking place next month at, um, towards the end of the hour. Yes, um, actually, yeah. my talk is going to be called uh, Decolonizing the, the Tragic Victorian Hero, you know, uh, who's Gordon of, of Khartoum. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There we go. That's I need to get link. my photo taken though with the statue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we have another question here, um, my, uh, anonymous question. What what advice would you give writers who are raised in the UK with a heritage that was affected by colonialism? Oh, okay. Read, just you know, read, read, read. Just read the, read, read, read these four books. Read other books. You know, um, reading is very, very important. Um, uh, if you can travel, if you can go to go back, do so. But I do think the, tra the the reading is actually more important than the traveling because you can get stuck in a bubble. If you travel, you can just remain in a bubble and not really encounter much. Also, speak to your uh, you know grandparents. They ha they have a lot to say. Listen to them. See what they're saying. You know, listen to their stories. That that is so 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 useful. Great, thank you, and. Um... Matthew would like to um, ask the following question. Would, would your other historical novels continue on from the same time period in Sudan, or would you want to cover any other topics or areas? I'm still kind of thinking about it. I still, I still haven't uh, decided what uh, the, the, the other novels will, will, will be like, but um, it's, it's, it's still, still, I'm still not, not sure, yeah. <laughs> And just again, um, a, a question uh, from Georgia, um, in terms of Fanon's black skin, white masks, are there any critical responses that you would recommend? Well, Nadia, you're the expert, you're, <laughs> cause you're, you're the one who teach, teaches Fanon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, when you say critical responses, um, would you, I'm not sure if the, what this, the speaker wants to, or the, the questioner, is is getting at but it's sort of um uh, taking issue with some of the things that fanon is, is is talking about i'm not sure if that's what the the the, the question is um about but david macy is somebody who does uh, you know done a lot of work around fanon i i'm not the expert in terms of my own research but i teach it i teach it um so david macy would be somebody to go and check out okay uh, yeah Okay, and then um, how is the author's work received by people in their countries from Paula? I'm not sure um, if that, yeah, that's, that's about all of them, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, of course, Fanon has a huge uh, following all over the world. And, in you know, when Al Algerians claim him as, as theirs, um, uh, so he's, uh, uh, you know, he's got a high position. The same for Tayyip Saleh. Uh, Season of migration is, uh, is credited to being one of the the best um, um, top top six Arabic novels of all time. Uh, same for Najuji. He's you know always up for the novel every year. Um, so that's fantastic. And, and Jennifer is, is Makumbi is very very popular at the moment and. Um, Know, got a huge uh, following in, in Uganda and in, in the UK yeah. and in the United States, yeah. I just unmute myself. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, probably we might not get through everything because we are running out of time, but um, I'll perhaps take a couple more questions um, from the Q&A. Um, how is it, um, so from, from um, S. Tomzi, what are the common elements in terms of voice between the works you referred to and maybe your own work as well? Um, how is it a decolonized voice which is being projected by these, these authors? Well, it's because they are, they are, you know, they are Africans themselves and they are the ones who are, um, you know, being aware of, aware of, of, of resisting, you know, there's a resistance in all these four books there's a there's a pushback against you know um, you know uh, that, that they are so um, uh, assertive and that they're so um, uh, you know aware of of their own um, uh, position with regard to the the European uh, co co coloni colonizing say. 
there was a question about the language being systematic. What does that mean? And I think it means that if you're studying uh, physics in English, for example, then um, that makes that makes the child think that English is the language of, of, of physics. English is the language of science. And that is very different than, than a child learning physics in Arabic. But somehow this causes a, a difference in, in the way the child is, is, um, uh, perceives language and perceives the, 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 the education system and perceives um, the influence of um, you know, Western scientists as opposed to Arab scientists on, 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 on science itself. Okay, and I think probably uh, apologies to the audience members, we won't get through everything, but I will take, um, there, there is another question here um, from Roos. Um, you brought up one of my favourite ideas, the notion of art as inherently collaborative as expressed by Ndugi uh, Worth Yongo. Um, often this is encountered or perceived as a power struggle right, between fan and creator as we strive for healthier race relations how can we also make this relationship between fan and creator less problematic? Um, I don't think it is problematic in all cases. I mean, it, it, it's it's there are certain cases where the 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 the, the fan is 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 uh, uh, you know posing a problem to the to to the to the to the creator. But it, not, this is not necessarily all the, the the case. It's not really about fan. It's not really about uh, performing to the to the to the audience. It's not about uh, gaining you know. It's not really about gaining followers and and, and gaining uh, sales and all this. Is not, I think the four writers are more. Um, uh, kind of transcended that and they're talking more about actually influencing people and actually uh, touching people's hearts and, 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 and touching people's minds I, I think as, as the, 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 um, the title of uh, Nijuji's um, book says. Okay um, thanks very much again Leila. I, uh, I think we will probably have to close close there um, but thank you again you know for uh, such a generous uh, masterclass uh, on decolonizing okay. the imagination thank you to the audience as well for your uh, questions in the chat and in the q a and for being here um uh, i just want to mention a couple of things before we close um if anyone's interested in reading these books which if they haven't done so um you can um get them via the University Blackwell's bookshop, okay? And that's available. If you go onto the Wayward website, you can go onto there and, and um, uh, purchase the, the, the texts. Um, thanks very much to the media services team, the events team, the Wayward Festival folk, to Leslie, to, um, uh, I'm just going to Katia Gort, uh, to Norma, our live captioner, and, um, and to Helen Lynch and Kirsty Lowey, as well as Richard Brown, our Zoom uh, technical expert. Um, thanks again to Creative Scotland and the University of Aberdeen. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this event. Um, as has been mentioned already, and as I've put into the chat, there is um, a symposium next month where Leila will be speaking at, uh, with some other writers. Um, so you've got some details there, but um, just get in touch with um, uh, Helen Lynch or Helen Eiffel if you want further uh, information about that. Okay, so thank you once again. Check out also Wayward on social media at Wayward um, ABDN. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Nadia. Thank you, everyone. And I'm on Instagram and Facebook. If I hadn't answered your question, I am happy to answer it on, on social media. Thank you all for being here this this uh, morning. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.